Hey there, welcome to Schmooze with Suze. I'm Suze Montgomery, your host, and today's show is something that I've been wanting to do for quite a while. Personal interest, yes, but also education. Uh, statistically, I'm looking at what's going on in America. I'm not talking politically, because if I started with that, we'd never finish. But I'm talking about what health is all about. You're, you hear about uh, Obamacare, you hear about Medicare, you hear about the statistics on cancer. This one is interesting to me for a lot of reasons on a personal level, but also on a level of my students. My students range in age anywhere from 85 to 105, and quite a few of them have Parkinson's disease. My brother-in-law has Parkinson's disease, and I want to know more. And with the rise of the statistics nationally, I want to introduce you to Patty and Jennifer, and we're talking Parkinson's today. Okay. So who wants to start? Who's got, Patty's got a lap I full of stuff. Well, <laughs> you're talking about the statistics. Yeah, Since, give me some numbers, kid. Um, we know right now there's at least seven to 10 million people worldwide who have Parkinson's disease. And uh, they're projecting that that number is going to double by 2042. So that's not that far away. Uh, the, more people, about at least a million Americans have Parkinson's disease. That, uh, that's probably still just the ones that we know of. A lot of people are un undiagnosed. And that is more than those that are affected by multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, and Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, do they kind of mirror each other? Jennifer and I were talking about that off camera. Do they mirror each other? Like uh, when you go to, I guess you would see a neurologist? Yes. Okay, Jen. So when you were really, really young when you were diagnosed? Yes. Yes, okay. I was 32. That is That's really when I young. actually got the diagnosis. Okay. By the way, Jen's last name is Parkinson. So go, tell us about how you were diagnosed. What did you, were you falling? I mean, what was happening? When I first noticed uh, the first symptom, I had a tremor in my right hand and I was a registered nurse. And I remember having to sit on my hand at my six week postpartum appointment because it was shaking. And I didn't really know what it was. I didn't know really what was going on. Didn't think anything major. Um, but then it began to happen more and more. Then I got to the point where I was having a tremor all the time. I was having a lot of fatigue. Uh, I was having trouble just keeping up with the kids and keeping up with the household. And when I would go see my doctor, I'd tell him, I'm, I'm really tired. I mean, I'm extremely fatigued. Just doing a load of laundry would just wipe me out for the day. And I said, well, you have a six-week-old and you have a three-year-old. Of course. Of course you're going to be tired. But it was different. It was, it was a different fatigue than I'd ever felt before. And like I said, the tremor got to be all the time. I started seeing more specialists. I saw a cardiologist and I saw an endocrinologist. Um, I went through all kinds of testing, all kinds of scans, MRIs, and nothing would come back. There was, they, there was, didn't they, they couldn't find, it. they couldn't find anything because you can't diagnose Parkinson's at that time. There was no scan that could show Parkinson's and there was no, no test, no blood test or anything that which that shows that you have Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So you just have to rule out every other disease and then they look at the symptoms. 
So the symptoms, the tr traditional symptoms would be a tremor, um, bradykinesia, which is slow movement, um, postural instability, um, balance. Um, so if you have those symptoms and you look like you have Parkinson's, then they test you by giving you a drug for Parkinson's. If you respond, and they say that's what you have. Now, Robert, my husband has Parkinson's. He was diagnosed uh, in 2008, but misdiagnosed for two years prior to that by a neurologist. And he had a lot of the classic symptoms that Jennifer's been talking about. He was telling his regular doctor, I feel like I'm locking up. I feel like I'm locking up. They're like, what does that mean? So send him to a neurologist. First thing they do is they do an MRI to make sure you don't have a brain tumor. Uh, but he, by the time we got to the neurologist, his handwriting had gone from beautiful to just teeny tiny. And he was telling the neurologist, I feel like I'm locking up. And the neurologist did this and that, even the oh, muscle testing with the needles. I can't mm -hmm. remember what that's called. But uh, he had also had a loss of sense of smell and he was acting out in his sleep. Finally, I heard a doctor talking about it on the radio, and he was had started a practice here locally, and he, they were talking about how important it was to get an early diagnosis so that could, you could begin treatment of Parkinson's. So I called him up, and they went down the list of symptoms, because at that time, the doctors concluded that Robert just had uh, an essential tremor and depression. So he just had a little tremor when he tried to shave or eat and depression. So I was, you know, dragging him up off the couch, let's go for a walk, you're just depressed and, you know, just dragging him out on the street practically. And so when this doctor's office said, okay, does, does he this, does he that, uh, is he walking with a shuffle? And I said, well, he is now, because by now it's two years later. And they said, does he have rigidity? I just start bawling because that's what the I feel like I'm locking up was and, mm -hmm. and I'll bet that was the beginning of your fatigue is just because right. you're working so hard to move those muscles so but with Robert he had not just depression but a really high component of anxiety and we are we've gone through a lot of years of medication adjustment and we've learned that at times when he's super anxious and freezing that I can give him his anti-anxiety medication, and it is like giving him Parkinson's medication, and he'll be fine until the next dose is due. And you can see it, as I, I think we talked about. I can tell just by looking at his face that it's starting, they get the Parkinson's mask, which is expressionless. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I can see that when he's just watching TV. I'm like, oh, whoops, I gotta give him his meds. So it's really important that you, the medication be given at, at the time it's due. Now, Jennifer has a different kind of medication that she has tried. Robert's super sensitive, and we've been through a lot with him with his medications. One time we had an incident where we ended up in the um, emergency room, speaking of Parkinson's awareness, and I mentioned to the uh, ER doctor, Robert has dopamine dysregulation syndrome, which means he's super sensitive to dopamine and he, if he takes too much, it, he has very negative side effects. But the ER doc was like, oh, dopamine. Let's see, there was a movie with Robin Williams, wasn't there? Oh my God. And I'm thinking, yeah, is that all he knows about dopamine? But uh, it's taken, you know, everybody is unique that has the disease and not every medicine that works for Jennifer will work for Robert, will work for Sam, will work for Jim, but it's, it's every So is it critical to find the right physician and yes. how to find a, bigger question, how do you find a physician that knows? There's a lot of neurologists around, I, right. uh, because we've been to a few, and I'm not convinced that they all have the same level of knowledge or education. Right. So, so how do you know? So I always say finding a good neurologist finding a movement disorder specialist, especially for people with Parkinson's, you should, should see a specialist. But finding the right doctor is like finding, you know, it's like a relationship, okay? 
you have to date a few bad ones. Yes. <laughs> and so you bad. get to and so you get to the right one. You know, the first one may not be the the, the right one for you. <laughs> or the second or third. Is but, there a movement specialist right. besides so, a neurologist? Yeah, so a movement disorder oh specialist God. is someone who specializes in Parkinson's disease. They have a higher level of training. Um, a general neurologist may not necessarily, most of the time, most of the time they will not have the specialization because mm -hmm. they're seeing all kinds of disorders. So they may okay. not see- Light just went on. Right, they may not see a large percentage of Parkinson patients. There are general neurologists that do, and, and it's great that you, if you can find one like that, but it is really important that you find the right one for you, the one that's going to listen to you, not just tell you what you should do, not just say, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this, but actually listen to you and say, okay, how is this working for you? How is this affecting you? What can we do to make, to make your quality of life better? Not just go by some standard, okay? So it's really, really important because mm -hmm. each person is different with Parkinson's. Your progression is different. How you respond to the medications is different. How you respond to exercise, how you respond to any therapy can be different from person to person. So it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the variations. I mean. But observing my students in my classes, like I said, over you know close to 20 years of watching a lot of people with Parkinson's, and they all exhibit different symptomatic, you know, issues going on here. Right. And so I've noticed uh, some just really rebel against taking some of their meds because it totally stones them out. They're gone, right? Some doctors say, "Let's wait," you know, until you really, really need it. Oh my gosh. And others will say. Let's go ahead and put on you such. on it immediately so that you can get the, have the best quality of life that you can. You know, um, for me personally, and this is just my own personal right. experience and what I needed, I had two, two young children. Oh my gosh. Um, I ended up going through a divorce. I needed to make sure that I had the best quality of life that I possibly yes. could. You which is why I can't just, I'm not just exercising. I do take medication. I've always been on medication since I was diagnosed. It's changed throughout the years. Sometimes as I've gone down on medication, sometimes I've gone up or added or taken something away. But I always work with my doctor to try and find what's going to be the best. So you're best constantly for me. seeing your doc, uh, you know, monitoring your condition. Yes, yes. I'm going to throw you important. a real curveball. It just occurred to me. This is going to be a th curve. What about? all the boo-ha-ha -ha about CBD oil. Is there any efficacy in doing something that kind of therapy or is that mostly just BS? What is, this is, this is exactly like, like how we respond to medication. And this is what I tell people. I, I personally have not done CBD oil or you know, yeah, any, any of those. Those, those things. But if it works for you, if it helps your anxiety, then do if it, it helps your symptoms, and you feel good, do it. You know, if you have a bad response and you don't like it, don't do it. It's the same thing. I've seen a huge variation in people say, that was the worst thing I ever did, uh -huh. and people said, this is the best thing I ever did. And it's the same thing with the medications. It's the same thing with therapies. The you reason know? I ask that is because I uh, taught a class last week, and the class the week before asked specifics, and I did not have the answers. But one of my students did, and he has MS. Mm -hmm. And he, actually, he sat there, and he goes, I would like to talk. He brought the subject up. He broached the subject. He goes about CBD oil. And everybody in the room went, whoa, like this. Because it, you know, they were take. He was doing all the usual pharmaceutical stuff, mm -hmm. and it wasn't working. And he just was. Uh, and he says, "I have started doing this CBD oil, and I've started researching as well. What is there efficacy? I mean, it, it, they use it, you know. And now that he said he started doing this, he says it relieves. It doesn't eradicate, but it right. relieves some of his symptoms. Right." 
Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's a lot of it being touted. I'm just curious about it myself. I right. guess we should probably do a show. I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't have any specifics. And again, I don't have personal experience with it. But I just know from, like, people that I've talked to with Parkinson's, it's a hot, hot issue. It it's being is. talked about in every Facebook group and every Parkinson's, you know, group. Everybody's talking about it. And everybody wants to know about it. And... Again, like I said, it's something that it's not an across the board, like this is going to work for no. every single person or it's not going to work. Well, it's your own so, personal chemistry, it right? It is. It is. So it's going to be affected I want to ask you about these. Yeah. Also, yeah, so. just yes. real quick on yeah, that Patty. subject, um, go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, my, you know, michaeljfox.org. Mm -hmm. They have got a couple of really recent articles about medical marijuana and uh, the conclusion is they still need to do more research because they haven't done any with just a placebo. And the other thing too, number one, you know, make sure that you talk with your doctor before you do oh, this. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, I have personal concerns because my son, husband is so sensitive to the doses of dopamine. Mm -hmm. We don't know if he's gonna get the same dose of medical marijuana. Plus, right. I also wanna just say uh, there may be a connection between pesticides and Parkinson's disease. Exposure to it. I am firmly convinced so, of that. Well, the, here's the thing, though. Not everybody. My grandfather had Parkinson's. He was a farmer. They used pesticides. Not every farmer gets Parkinson's disease. No. And not everybody that went to Vietnam ended up with Parkinson's disease, but a lot of them did through different exposures. Um, for Robert, he was a child of the '60s, and pot was a big deal back then. And we know that some of it was soaked in Paraquat, which is a known, it's, it's on the list of pes, pesticides that are linked with Parkinson's. So we think that it, there might be something dormant that gets lit sure. up with exposure to that. So because uh, medical marijuana is not, you know, we just don't have enough There's information enough and information, control yeah. about it. Like, like we know that the Carvedopa levodopa comes in a 25,100 dose and 5,200 is it? So uh -huh. we know that those are the doses, but I don't know if every time you buy your CBD oil or your marijuana that you're getting the, the same consistency. Well, see, this purity. is it. There's so many unknown factors because it's relatively new. Yeah. I mean, because in our day, you know, we're of a certain age, the old stoners here from the 60s. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, because we never thought ahead. You know, we were, it was recreational. But now mm -hmm. that there is, you know, some published credible white papers out there on it, and you know, I'm reading everything I can, I, I get my hands on, I'm curious. And then also living in an ag area, which we live in, right. Ventura County's ag, right? Mm -hmm. And, I'm th and uh, I've had breast cancer numerous times and every one of them pretty much point to uh, pesticides, right? Uh, our non-organic fertilizers, because we live here. San, uh, the county of Ventura is the number one breast cancer in the state oh of California. Word. This is it, we hold the record for that. So not a big surprise where we live. My husband and I, the, it used to be a lemon orchard, not a big surprise. There's a lot of things out there that point to different, could be diseases. Mm -hmm. This button that I'm wearing is uh, the Parkinson's disease registry was finally funded. It's, it's uh, stop Parkinson's disease, find the cause, find a cure. And what we, what, uh, the registry was supposed to do, and we're still trying to fine tune it so that it will now that it's been funded, is study different areas throughout California to find the link. Is there a big pocket of, oh, of people who worked areas. in the strawberry fields yeah. that got Parkinson's disease? You know, does Bakersfield have more than Ventura County? So that will be, that's research that will help help to find the cause, which can help find the cure, hopefully, ultimately. So you, this is the organization that you work with, correct? No, this is someone that's actually working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. They, they okay. merged the, the California Parkinson's Registry, and one of your associates knows it very well. She worked very hard on it to get it funded. She works at the city, uh, Aurora, Aurora. Soriana. Wish you were here, Aurora. And the California Department of Public Health now has it in their hands. When it first was launched, uh, we were told, okay, make sure your doctor knows that they're supposed to report every case, you know, uh, 
Parkinson's disease. You know, t take this flyer in, show it to your doctor, tell them to go online and put your name in there. Well, the VA decided they didn't want to participate. And then some of the doctors thought, no, that's only if you were newly diagnosed. Not, and then I started to think, okay, well, they've got to have a handle on this because Robert sees, and I wanted to mention this too, a psychiatrist and a neurologist and his regular MD and a cardiologist. So if you want four doctors reporting one person, there's got to be some connection. Connection, there. yeah, so that you're not getting four, counting four when it's only one. But I wanted to mention real quick about Parkinson's. The other thing that I think is a good idea, if because a lot of people will have the anxiety and depression, uh, a good therapist working hand in hand with your movement disorder specialist to balance things out. We finally found that balance, and it's been a godsend because the the movement disorder specialist isn't the specialist in psychotropic meds, but the psychiatrist is. And if you find a psychiatrist who's also really familiar with Parkinson's disease, it's just golden. And we have them locally in Ventura? There is one in Camarillo that gets it, and I can say her name if you'd like me to. Sure. Dr. Lorna Barte, she's just fabulous. I didn't know we had anybody and of that talent. When you go through, like Jennifer yeah. said, the dating process with doctors, Robert and I have ended up at UCLA and I also want to add that it's extremely important for care partners to go to the doctor appointments with the person who has Parkinson's disease because it is, you know, for Robert, his, he was diagnosed later on and it's now in the cognitive stage where he's compromised and um, I take care of the meds or, yeah, it, well, You're the when doser. he was doing it, it was a You're mess. You're the doser. <laughs> yes, I am. And um, so you need to, the care partner needs to be aware and and I know you know there were several years I was in denial about it too and I still kind of am a little bit but maybe it's the little bit that's good because Robert you can do this we can go for a walk we can yes. do this we can mm -hmm. go golfing because staying active is so important yeah I, yes. I'm sure I'm talking about that will you hold those up for me yes you gotta check this out guys okay. these are <laughs> boxing gloves, gloves? My boxing gloves. Yeah. so tell us about the story of this one um, so um, when, when I was diagnosed, my doctor told me I would be in a wheelchair in 10 years um, and told me I would have been unable to take care of myself or my children within 10 years. And I told him I was going to prove him wrong. I was very stubborn and hard-headed. Um, so as, unfortunately, I tried to keep working as a nurse, that did not happen. Um, I quickly had to go on disability and then things were progressing and I went through a divorce. And here I am, a single mom, my kids are five and eight, and I need to be there for them. I need to be a healthy, active mother, and I wasn't. I was having rigidity, I was freezing, where I couldn't move at all sometimes, two, three times a day, as the meds would wear off and then I'd wait for the next dose to kick in. So I knew I had to do something. There, it was just gonna progress. It was just gonna keep getting worse, as the doctor had told me. And so I found out, I was on the internet one night, and I found out about a program that was teaching boxing to people who have Parkinson's disease. People from all stages, um, people from early diagnosis all the way to late stages and they're all having good results. But they were across the country. There was only one in the country at that time in Indiana. So I started, I called up a trainer here in Agora Hills, where I live. Um, he's an eight-time world kickboxing champion. And I started training the fight of my life. I started training with guys that were gonna get in the ring that, that weekend to fight. <laughs> um, so we were running, we were doing burpees, push-ups, planks, you know, um, holding a weight bar over our head while running eight laps in the parking lot. Oh my God. And oh my God. when I first started, I, I mean, I'd never done any, I was not very active. I wasn't, I wasn't going to the gym at all, and I never really had before. I was never really into that. And I started working out, and 
15 minutes in, and my, my muscles were rigid. I would just start kind of freezing up. And my trainer would, um, there was a shot that I was taking at the time called the Apikin. And he'd give me the shot and when I start freezing, and that would get me going again really quickly. And he's like, he'd get me up off the floor, we'd get out of the ring, he'd go get me a shot, he said, get back in the ring. And his model is you finish what you start. So I was never not, I was never not allowed, to, I was never allowed not to finish. Um, I always finished. And he um, would just kind of push me, talk me through the workouts. And we did this like over and over, you know, you know, all these weeks and months. And I started to respond to the exercise. I started to have better energy. I started to be able to play with my kids for the first time. I mean, I remember not being able to take my kids to the park, not being able to play outside with them. And I remember the day when I was able to take my son to the park and we played soccer for three hours. Oh my God. For the first time. This is like a miracle. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And so over the months, I started to get a little bit better, a little bit better. How often do you do this? I, I do, now I do boxing about three to four days a week because I do other things. I'm doing spinning now because we have a spinning program <laughs> and I'm running and hiking. Um, I'm getting ready for a hundred mile Camino in Sicily. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's in June. Awesome. Uh, so um, I, about three years ago, I went to Sicily with a group of, uh, uh, called 10 Mountains, 10 Years and to raise awareness for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. My dad passed away from Alzheimer's disease. And so we went to um, climb Mount Etna in Sicily. In there. Yeah, pretty amazing. Um, I'd never done anything like that ever in my life. And it was, it was truly a challenge for me. But it was, it was an incredible thing to be able to get to that point that I was physically able to do that because I knew there were so many people that couldn't do that. I want to thank you both for doing this. This is, I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. I just don't know <laughs> what to say, but I'm just so grateful that we pursued this and I'm so grateful you're here and I'm so grateful that you're part of my life now. Thank so. you for bringing awareness to oh, this no, disease. Thank, no, thank you for doing what so you important. do. important. Thank yes. you for, because you're not done here. <laughs> you're coming back. Okay. And I, I invite you all to come back for part two. I'm just overwhelmed. And this is pretty amazing. Come back and see us soon. Thanks for being here.